This is a video that I'm making to support a course that I'm teaching on introductory proof writing. And in the last video, we looked at the notion of a relation on a set. And here we wanna look at the notion of an equivalence relation with a bunch of examples. So let's first recall that a relation R on a set A is really just any subset of A cross A. So any subset that you can think of, that is considered a relation. But since we're thinking about a relation as a means to compare two elements of A, we generally write X is related to Y like this, X R Y, if and only if X comma Y is in R. So we kind of think about it like this instead of like this, although by definition it is a subset of the cross product with itself. Okay, next we call a relation an equivalence relation if it satisfies three additional properties. The first property is known as reflexivity, and that says that every element is related to itself. The second property is called symmetry, and that says that if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. Finally, we've got the transitive property. That says that if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. So in the last video, we looked at these properties and when they held and when they did not hold. We had some examples of relations that were indeed not equivalent relations. Next, we need the notion of an equivalence class. So an equivalence class is attached to an element, and it's the set of all elements that are equivalent to an element or related to that element. And generally, it's denoted by these square back brackets around X. So this would be called the equivalence class of X although there are different notations. So here I wanna look at four quick examples of equivalence relations on the same set. So say we've got this set containing the integers negative two, negative one, one, and two, and we wanna look at some equivalence relations on this set. So the first equivalence relation is just equality. So obviously equality is gonna be an equivalence relation on any set, and in some ways, it's one of the most boring equivalence relations. It's like too fine of a filter for elements from the set. So we could make a graph of this equivalence relation by just putting these directed arrows on all of the elements of our set. So negative one, negative two, one, and two, where those directed arrows mean that this element is related to itself. But notice there is no edge from negative one to two, negative two to one, so on and so forth, and that's because those are not related to each other under this equality. Okay, and now the equivalence classes here, well, everything that's equivalent to negative one, that's just negative one. Everything equivalent to negative two, that's just negative two, and so on and so forth. So indeed, the equivalence classes are really just singletons involving all of the elements from the set. So like I said, we didn't really the filter the set into a simpler object like this. Okay, so let's look at the other extreme. And here the relation is nothing. And what I mean by that is everything is related to something else. So for these others, since it's gonna get a bit messy, I'm gonna not draw arrows, but notice we don't need arrows with equivalence relations because symmetry is assumed. So if everything is related to everything else, then that creates something called the complete graph. So here, negative one is related to itself, so we've got a little bubble around that. One is related to itself, negative two is related to itself, and two is related to itself, so we have all of those loops. The next, negative one is related to one, it's related to two, and it's related to negative two. And then we can continue on. So one is related to two and negative two. It's already related to negative one. And then finally, we can finish this thing off like that. So notice there's an edge between every vertex. But what about the equivalence classes in this case? Well, notice everything is related to each other, so we only have one equivalence relation, and that's the whole set. So negative one, negative two, one, and two. And notice that's gonna be the equivalence class of one, the equivalence class of two, the equivalence class of any of these elements from the set. And I guess I might wanna point out here that this 
element X that we're building the equivalence class out of is sometimes called the equivalence class representative. So notice we may have more than one representative for the same equivalence class. Here we have one as a representative for the equivalence class and two is and negative one and negative two are as well. Okay, nice. Now we're gonna look at another equivalence relation which is the parity equivalence relation. What I mean by parity is evenness or oddness. So in other words, two elements are related if they are of the same parity, if they're both even or they are both odd. So you can easily check that that is an equivalence relation indeed. So here, that means negative one's related to itself, one is related to itself, and then negative one and one are related. Then similarly, negative two is related to itself, two is related to itself, and then two and negative two are related. So that would be a picture of the same parity equivalence relation. Okay, nice. So we can maybe go ahead and write the equivalence classes of this as negative two, two, and negative one, one. So that split this set into two equivalence relations. So whereas this split the set into just one equivalence class, well, that's kind of too coarse of a filter. This was too fine of a filter. Well, maybe this is getting towards the point where it is an interesting filter depending on what the relation is. Okay, so now let's do the same sign equivalence relation. We'll notice negative one and negative two are the same sign, and one and two are the same sign. They're both negative or both positive, respectively. So essentially we have this picture just rotated a little bit. So we've got a little bubble here, we've got a little bubble here, and then we've got an edge. So bubble, bubble, edge. And then we can go ahead and write this down as the set containing negative one, negative two, and then the set containing one and two. And just to be super thorough, we notice that here we can take an equivalence class representative of negative one. So that's the equivalence class of negative one. And here we could take the equivalence class re representative to be two. So we could say that's the equivalence class of two. Although we had a choice there, we could have also chosen negative two here or one there. Okay, so now that we've got these basics out of the way, let's go ahead and clean up the board and look at some more examples. So for our next example, we're gonna let A be the set of smooth functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. I wanna point out that there's a notation for this and that would be like C infinity. So what I mean by smooth is that they are infinitely differentiable. Okay, and we're gonna say that F is related to G if and only if f double prime is equal to g double prime. So there's not really much to check about this being an equivalence relation, given that equality is very clearly an equivalence relation, and this is kind of built on the back of equality. Okay, so maybe let's look at some equivalence classes. So maybe we'll look at the equivalence class of the function zero, which I'll just denote by that. So that's the function that takes everything to zero, so notice that this is gonna be all functions f such that f double prime is equal to zero double prime, but notice that zero double prime is just zero. But I wanna point out that this is really the same thing as saying that f is related to zero because that's exactly what we're trying to do. This equivalence class is defined as is over here. Now you wanna look at this and maybe think about something that you've learned in like a calculus class and answer the question, well, what types of functions do we get if their second derivative is equal to zero? And you'll see that we have linear functions and that's really all that we have. So that tells us that we can write this as ax plus b, where a and b are real numbers. So that's the class of functions that are all related to zero. They're just linear polynomials. Okay, and then likewise, we can easily show that for an arbitrary function f, the equivalence class is going to be made up of all functions of the form f of x plus ax plus b, where a and b are real numbers. And why is that? Well, let's take a g of x inside of here and notice that in this case, g double prime of x is equal to f double prime of x. 
And that's because the second derivative of ax is going to be equal to zero. The second derivative of b is clearly equal to zero. But this is the same thing as saying that g is related to f. But that's how you get inside of this equivalence class in the first place. So we can say that that means that g is in this equivalence class. So we started with a G on the right-hand side and showed that G had to be on the left-hand side. Really, we've just shown set containment in one direction. You'd maybe want to show it in the other direction as well. Okay, let's maybe get rid of this and we'll do another example. For our next example, we're gonna let A be the power set of the set containing one, two, and three. Let's recall that the power set is the set of all subsets. So this is a three element set. So that means that we know its power set contains eight elements. Okay, and then we're going to say that two subsets are related, in other words, A, R, B, if and only if they have the same size, so their cardinality is the same, which we can denote by this like thing that looks like absolute value of A and absolute value of B. So again, there's not much to check here to show that it's an equivalence relation, and that's because this is built on the back of equality again, as actually a lot of equivalence relations are built somehow out of equality, and it just comes down to using the fact that equality is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So let's maybe look at the equivalence classes. So first off, we could look at the equivalence class of the empty set. So we've got a three element set here, which means we have possible subset sizes of 0, 1, 2, and 3. There's clearly no four element subset of a three element set. So now we want to look for all of the subsets of 1, 2, 3 that have zero elements. But notice there's only one of those, and that's just the empty set. So the equivalence class of the empty set is just the empty set. Next, we could look at the equivalence class of one of the singletons. And notice that that's going to be the set containing all of the singletons. Because the singletons, by definition, have just one element. So notice here we've got the set containing, the set containing one, two, and the set containing three, like that. In other words, all of the singletons. And those are gonna be related, again, because they each have a single element. Okay, now let's look at the equivalence class of one of the doubletons, or sometimes known as unordered pairs in set theory. So this would be like the set containing one, two, one, three, or two, three. Those are all equivalence class representatives for this equivalence class. Well, again, we've got three elements here. The set containing one, two, the set containing one, three, and then finally the set containing two, three. So all of those are equivalent to each other under this relation because they have the same number of elements. Okay, finally, we can have the set containing one, two, three. That would be the unique three element subset of one, two, three. But notice that's just gonna be the set containing the set containing one, two, three. In other words, there's only one element in that equivalence class and it's the whole set. So this is a picture of the equivalence classes of A under this relation. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of this and then we're gonna prove an interesting general result. So like I said, we're gonna finish this thing off with a little bit of a general result. And I really like this problem. I'd say that if you are in my course, this is likely to be one of the exam problems. So let's suppose that R1 and R2 are both equivalence relations. And I want to point out here that that means they are both subsets of A cross A. Then we define a new relation, which is the intersection of R1 and R2. So notice immediately we know that that is a relation because since R1 and R2 are subsets of A cross A, their intersection is also a subset of A cross A. And what we want to do is show that this is an equivalence relation. So it's not only a relation, but it satisfies these three properties over here. So maybe let's go ahead and look at this proof, and maybe we'll first say clearly R1 intersect R2 is a subset of A cross A. There's not really anything to do there. That's because R1 intersect R2 is a subset of R1, which itself is a subset of A cross A. Now let's first look at reflexivity. 
So in other words, we want to suppose that we've got an arbitrary x in A, and then our goal, so I'll put that here, we want to show that x r x. In other words, x comma x is an element from r, where r is given as that intersection. Okay. Well, so first of all, since R1 and R2 are equivalence relations, we know that X is R1 related to X and X is R2 related to X. But in the set world, that means X comma X is in R1. That's what this one means. And x comma x is in R2. That's what this one means. But then that and statement implies that x comma x is in R1 intersect R2, but that's exactly our definition of R. But notice x comma x being in R is equivalent to saying that x is related to itself. So we have proven reflexivity. So maybe I will leave symmetry for you guys and I'll prove transitivity on the next board. So we just got done proving that this relation was reflexive. I'm going to leave it as a homework for you guys to prove that it's symmetric. And here I will prove that it is transitive. So let's maybe go ahead and suppose that X is related to Y and Y is related to Z. And then point out that that means to end this, we want to show that X is related to Z. That's the condition of transitivity as defined over here. So first off, what we wanna do is push this into the set world instead of the relation world, so we can make use of the definition of intersection essentially. Okay, so what that tells us is that X comma Y is an element from R, but notice that R is R1 intersect R2 and y comma z is an element from r, but again, r is equal to r1 intersect r2. But now let's decompose what that intersection means. So this tells us that x comma y is in r1 and x comma y is in r2. So that's how this statement right here branches off. And then similarly, this statement over here branches off essentially the same way. So we've got y comma z is in R1 and y comma z is in R2. So like I said, that's the branching off of that. And now we just pair these and statements a little bit differently than they're already paired. So we're going to pair x comma y is an R1 and y comma z is an R1. And then we'll also pair x comma y in R2 and y comma z is in R2. But now the blue underlying things tell us that x is related one to y and y is related one to z under that first relation. And then the yellow underlines say essentially the same thing, but with relation to. So we have X R two Y and Y R two Z. But now that we're in these individual equivalence relations, we can apply the transitivity of these independent equivalence relations. So the transitivity here with R one implies that X is R1 related to Z. And then the transitivity here with R2 implies that X is related R2 to Z. But now we'll go back into our set world. So this implies that X comma Z is in R1 and X comma Z is in R2. But that and conjunction can be turned into an intersection. This means that X comma Z is in R1 intersect R2, which is defined to be R. But this tells us that X is related to Z, which is exactly where we wanted to end up for this transitivity. And that's a good place to stop.